Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Renan Levine. Uh, I, in my day job, is uh, a American politics professor at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Um, but today I'm here in my capacity that I am a longtime member of Congregation Darche Noam, which is Toronto's Reconstructionist congregation. Um, we are physically located uh, on Shepherd Avenue um, between Bathurst and the Allen. Um, but of course, during these pandemic times, um, we are pleased to be hosting events like this um, on Zoom. Um, even though we are virtual, um, I do want to acknowledge um, the land uh, that the synagogue does sit on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, um, uh, the, and <laughs> the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations. But the panelists and hosts today um, are included in other locations, um, such as Montreal, Quebec, uh, and Vaughan, Ontario, and I would direct you to their appropriate land acknowledgements for those locations. I want to begin by welcoming everyone. Um, I'm very excited about this event. Um, we have four very distinguished speakers um, to talk uh, about anti-Semitism today. Uh, a topic that's been very much in the news and very much a topic of conversation uh, in our community. Um, these speakers come from a variety of backgrounds um, and bring different expertise and very different perspectives. So my hope as moderator for this evening is to hopefully facilitate a situation where we are learning from both where they agree and where they disagree, learn more about where they come from when they take the positions that they take and so on. So while there will be some disagreements, this is not a debate. Um, we will um, be allowing time for question and answer. So if you do have questions for the panelists, uh, I would encourage you to use the chat uh, here on the Zoom. What you would be doing is you would be sending your questions to me as the moderator. Um, and then um, when the opportunity arises, I will relay those questions to all of the panelists. Um, the rabbi of Congregation Darche Noam, Rabbi Tina Grimberg, has asked me to read a statement from her before we begin. Rabbi Grimberg writes, I'm in full support of this difficult topic and the panel that represents diversity and multivocality of opinions and views. As I am writing this note, I see my library heavily laden with books of our Jewish laws. Our people have always rightfully prided ourselves on vibrant discussion, learning, and at times, disagreement. The ultimate and necessary umbrella for this vibrancy will always be love for one Jew to another and our love and understanding of humanity. In a world of turbulence and uncertainty, discussions like these are necessary and vital. I thank the organizers of the panel and its panelists for their scholarship and willingness to share their views. Again, that is Rabbi Tina Grimberg of Congregation Darche Noam. Now I would like to welcome um, our panelists. Um, we are gonna to hear tonight from Noah Shack, who is the Vice President, Greater Toronto Area, from CJA, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. Prior to joining CJA, he previously worked at the Canada-Israel Committee and the Washington-based Middle East Institute, and as Director of Canadian Academics for Peace in the Middle East. We are also joined by Bernie Farber, the former CEO of Canadian Jewish Congress and the current chair of the Canadian Anti-Hate Network. Professor Morton Weinfeld joins us from Montreal. He is the professor of sociology at McGill University, where he holds the chair in Canadian Ethnic Studies and for many years has taught sociology of Jews in North America. His most recent publication is, like everyone else, but different, the paradoxical success of Canadian Jews. And my fellow Darche Noam member, Professor Cheryl Nestle, who is a former lecturer in the Department of Sociology and Equity Studies at OISE, the University of Toronto, and a former member of the National Steering Committee of the Independent Jewish Voices Canada. Her most recent publication is The Use and Misuse of Antisemitism Statistics in Canada. Now, what we are going to do is I've asked each of our panelists um, to speak for five minutes as opening remarks, sharing their main ideas, their main perspectives. I will then give them a chance to 
uh, respond to each, then I will ask a couple of questions um, and then we'll be looking for audience to be able to send me questions. So um, we are going to start with Mr. Noah Shack of CJA. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, am I on mute? I, I, uh, I'm not, okay. Thanks, Renan. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you and uh, with the Darche Noam congregation, which counts among its members some incredible pillars of our community. And I'm probably gonna get in trouble for doing this, but I would like to single out for Del Brief in particular, who has possibly done more than any lay person in our community to build interfaith bridges in this city. It's a privilege to be welcomed into her spiritual home this evening. I think that uh, Fridell and others who know me would agree that I'm not an alarmist, but I'm very much alarmed by the anti-Semitism we're experiencing here in Canada and here in Toronto today. To be sure, we don't face the anti-Semitism my grandparents experienced growing up. Jewish children are not routinely pelted with stones on their way to school, as my grandfather was, and we're not formally barred from professions or public spaces. A lot of this has to do with the hard work of my predecessors, uh, including you know, uh, people who are on this panel uh, tonight, um, in, who spent decades tirelessly pushing for human rights and equality for Jewish Canadians. But as Erwin Kotler, Canada's special envoy on preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism points out, anti-Semitism is at its highest levels since the Holocaust. This doesn't mean we're in Europe of 1939, but there's a real danger of Canada, Canadian society looking more like Europe of 2021 down the road. Any of you who participated in Jewish life in Europe know that it comes with armed police or military at the door, with attacks at synagogues, schools, museums, grocery stores, cultural centers, the list goes on, with Jewish students viciously attacked by their peers in schools. I'm concerned for the future of my children here in Canada, not because I fear another Holocaust, God forbid, because I fear a situation of much closer proximity. Of all the challenges we face in this regard, the greatest is perhaps the mainstreaming of anti-Semitism across all quarters of our society. Anti-Semitism is a mutating virus that adapts itself to a wide array of contexts. It's persisted for thousands of years through adaptation. Virtually no political ideology, philosophical tradition, religious theology, geography, people or history is immune. The rise of anti-Semitism here in Canada should be a wake up call for every single one of us to take a stand against the increasing normalization of Jew hatred in our own backyards. Today here in Canada, Jew hatred continues to fester and spread throughout our society on the political left, on the political right, in urban centers and rural settings, among human rights champions and white supremacists, among Muslims and among Christians. It is everywhere and everyone is susceptible and its roots run deep. This has always been the case, but anti-Semitism is increasingly coming out of the shadows and being accepted or tolerated in the mainstream. And that's what keeps me up at night and makes me concerned for my children's future. Part of what facilitates this is a tendency, and it's a natural tendency, to fixate exclusively on the anti-Semitism that occurs outside one's own ideological circle. But this is a self-destructive trap, an all too common phenomenon. The European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights did a study on anti-Semitism with a sample size of more than 16,000 people. One of its findings, and I quote, the normalization of anti-Semitism is also evidenced by the wide range of perpetrators, which spans the entire social and political spectrum. The most frequently mentioned categories of perpetrators of the most serious incidents of anti-Semitic harassment experienced by the respondents include someone they did not know, 31%, someone with an extremist Muslim view, 30%, someone with a, a left-wing political view, 21%, a colleague from work or school or college, 16%, an acquaintance or friend, 15%, and someone with a right-wing political view, 13%. Here in Canada, we're seeing a resurgent far-right anti-Semitism, a resurgence of the swastika and white supremacist hate groups who are using social media in particular to radicalize and recruit youth. And it's not just white youth either. I've spoken with parents whose children have been viciously bullied by racialized kids, articulating neo-Nazi messages and threats they picked up from Call of Duty or TikTok. And we're not talking about high school even. This is, these are middle school kids who are, are swallowing these dangerous memes uh, and taking action based on them. 
We're seeing a rise in far left anti-Semitism with conspiracy theories about Jews, drawing on some of the ugliest tropes about Jewish power and malevolence being trotted out by some progressives and critical social justice activists. Erasure, tokenization, or vilification of our identity, purity tests and double standards applied to negate our lived experience. These two groups would like to think that they're distinct, opposite in every respect, mortal enemies. But when it comes to anti-Semitism, they can share more in common than either would care to admit. There's no difference between the assertion that the Mossad controls the Canadian government made by the former owner of food vendors and the same conspiracy theory articulated by the leader of the Canadian Nationalist Party, that one is animated by progressive pro-Palestinian activism and the other is a neo-Nazi is irrelevant. We need to focus on the anti-Semitism rather than the anti-Semite if we're going to be successful in pushing back against it throughout our society. Uh, I painted a pretty bleak picture, but I want to close uh, with my, my short uh, opening uh, time with something a little bit more hopeful. The good news is that Canada, um, in Canada here, most anti-Semitism is due to ignorance. There's tremendous power in education and person-to-person -person interaction. Most people don't want to be anti-Semitic. And when they're confronted with that, the impact that they have on Jewish people, they tend to respond by being horrified that they have played into this phenomenon. And at this alarming time, we need unity and concerted action more than ever to accomplish the task before us of collectively pushing back against anti-Semitism becoming normalized or more mainstream across our society. There's lots more that I can, I'd like to say on the subject, but I, I'll be respectful of the time and stop here. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you so much again for having me. Thank you. Mr. Bernie Farber. Uh, thank you, uh, Renan, and uh, thank you uh, to the uh, Darche Noam for inviting me to participate in what is clearly a, an important um, issue, an issue that I have been dealing with for almost three decades. And I, I have to say at the very beginning that uh, in, in the three decades, there have been uh, titanic shifts in terms of how we understand anti-Semitism and how we view anti-Semitism. Back when I started at Canadian Jewish Congress, and people like uh, Morton and others will, will remember this and even before, um, we had one basic understanding and definition of anti-Semitism. And it actually goes back to uh, philosophers like Theodore Doro and others who, who said quite specifically, anti-Semitism is a rumor about the Jews. And so when you distill all of the definitions that we have now evolved into today, whether it's the IRA definition, which is the International Holocaust uh, definition that has been um, uh, lobbied for and accepted by various uh, governments here in Canada, provincial, uh, federal, um, uh, municipal universities, et cetera, or the Jerusalem Declaration or others, uh, we have to understand the evolution of anti-Semitism itself. Now, Noah spoke uh, very uh, poignantly about the, the concepts of anti-Semitism coming from both the left and the right. And uh, that in, in, in some cases, and my father used to say this as well, that when it comes to Jews, the left and the right can meet somewhere in the middle in terms of their hatred of Jews. Uh, that is an experience that my father, who was a Holocaust survivor, had in Europe. Um, but at the end of time, when one deals with uh, how we need to identify anti-Semitism, what anti-Semitism should mean to Jews here in Canada. Uh, I take a very uh, black and white look at this. For me, it's about what and who are walking into our synagogues and murdering us uh, at prayer. Uh, the, the idea of deadly anti-Semitism in this country is almost unthinkable. And yet it wasn't all that long ago, just south of the border where a neo-Nazi did walk into a synagogue, the Tree of Life in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, murdered 11 Jews at prayer, injured many more. Um, and just a short time later, of course, we had other synagogue uh, entries, et cetera, et cetera. We are dealing with deadly anti-Semitism coming from the far right. We are dealing with a form of uh, a, a political anti-Semitism coming from the left. 
there is nothing that can ever convince me that anti-Semitism only exists on one side of the scale. But one thing we do know, and this is what happens pretty consistently, what do we mean when we talk about anti-Semitism coming from the left? And what do we mean by when we talk about anti-Semitism coming from the right? Anti-Semitism coming from the left has all kinds of different strict, uh, strictures and branches. Um, people, of course, are beginning to identify it in relation to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which I'm sure uh, we're going to get into. But let us be clear. Palestinians have a right to their uh, beliefs and have a right to their uh, sense of actions and have a right to the discrimination that has been visited upon them by Israeli policy. They have a right to, to own those feelings and they have a right to, to, uh, to complain about it. They have a right to uh, invest their time in demonstrating about it, just as we as Jews have the right to respond to that. When does it become anti-Semitism? When does anti-Zionism roll into anti-Semitism? These are the questions that we have to answer. And of course, in, in specifically in the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, there is a clear statement that says that it, it, people have the prior right to criticize Israeli policy as long as it's done fairly and equitably as one criticizes policies of any free and democratic nation. And so here in Canada, for example, I have been very vocal in, in, in uh, stating my belief that Canada committed a genocide against First Nations people. I've been saying that since 2011, at which time the emails and, and the messages that I received were plentiful to say the least. Today, when we talk about the genocide of First Nations and Canada's responsibility in it, it is accepted and understood. Nobody says I'm anti-Canadian for doing so. So we have to understand and find that balance. And that is very particularly on the left side of the spectrum. On the right side of the spectrum is where assaults, attacks, and even murder occurs because one is a Jew. Jew hatred on the right and on the extreme right leads to death. That's where it actually ends. And Noah actually mentioned the Canadian Nationalist Party. I think people here would be interested. It's a bona fide political party. That's a neo-Nazi party. It's accepted as a bona fide political party. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean that, you know, less, what, what does it mean? 300 people voted for the Canadian Nationalist Party in the last election. Maybe you see that as a, as, a, as a small deal, but let's understand this. The Canadian Nationalist Party has access to the Canadian voters list. That means that every one of you here that voted in the last national, uh, last federal election is now on a list owned by the leadership of the Canadian Nationalist Party. And even if there are 500 people that voted for them, if out of 500, 50 of them are bound and determined neo-Nazis who wanna get rid of Jews from Canada, you know where that leads to. So let me just sum up by saying this. Yes, there is anti-Semitism on both sides of the political spectrum. I accept that. But we have to be careful in terms of its definition and of, and of its understanding and where it leads to. And we certainly have to be careful in terms of what we understand as anti-Semitism that's politically motivated and anti-Semitism, the classical forms of which we as Jews here in Canada are most susceptible to. My, my nightmare when I was the head of the Canadian Jewish Congress is that I would be woken at night or I would wake up the next morning or I would get a telephone call because we didn't have a lot of emails at that time telling me that a synagogue has been invaded by a neo-Nazi and five or six or 10 or 20 Jews were murdered. That was my nightmare. I, I, I was lucky in that I didn't have to deal with that. Today, we have to deal with it. We've dealt with it three times already in the last five years. That means it's going to happen again and that's where we have to put our energy. We have to put our energy behind protecting Jews from the most deadliest forms of anti-Semitism. Thank you. Professor Morton Weinfeld. We need to unmute. Wait, you've you've inadvertently muted yourself again. 
Actually, that was my fault. My, All right, my I'll try apologies. it again. Can, okay. can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay, just let me, uh, don't take off my five minutes just yet. Okay, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here to speak to the Darche Dar Noam community. It's a community I know quite well, and I, I'm delighted to share this, uh, this, this panel, this, this uh, event with, with these three other distinguished panelists. So what can you say in five minutes? So very quickly, uh, anti-Semitism has a long history. I, I, I trace its origin with Hava Nidchak Malo. Why did Pharaoh decide to enslave the Jews? And the reason he did that was not because they had the wrong beliefs or not because they had the wrong ideology, because he perceived them as being a threat, as having dual loyalty, and therefore probably not likely to conspire against the Egyptian uh, regime. And therefore, pro proactively, he decides to enslave the Jews. So that's the idea, dual loyalty and then conspiring against the existing regime. 3,000 years ago. Since then, anti-Semitism has shape-shifted a great deal. First, Jews had the wrong religion. They had re wrong religion, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Christianity. Uh, they had the wrong religion vis-a-vis -vis Islam. Both the Christians and the Muslims early thought that the Jews would embrace those religions. They did not. They let them down. Racism comes along. Jews were the wrong species. They were not really the same kind of species as other people. Then, of course, as was alluded to before, you have right-wing anti-Semitism and left-wing anti-Semitism. So, you know, Jews are loyal, not uh, to the state, but to the socialist ideology or the communist ideology, or Jews are loyal not to the state, but to capitalism and finance. So however you want to slice and dice it, the Jews are not loyal to the existing power structure. So now we come to the present. And I, I'll confess I'm influenced a lot by my campus setting at McGill and my discussions with all sorts of students in class, outside of class, et cetera. So this will account for what I will be saying, but in the Q&A, there are many other issues of anti-Semitism that we can raise. So very simply, the current issue on campus is, I think Bernie raised it, what is the link between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? And this is on the minds of many students, I would say, and many others who are, who are not students. Certainly many in the progressive community, for sure. So is anti-Zionism going to take its place along with all the other isms that I just mentioned before as challenging the idea of Jews as loyal citizens and even as possible progressives? So by anti-Zionism, by the way, by anti-Zionism, I'm not talking about criticism of Israel. Harsh criticism of Israel, wonderful. I would, I'm simply talking about the idea that, that Israel does not have a right to exist as an independent Jewish state. That is what I will talk about in the next three and a half minutes. And, and, and Israel therefore also does not have the right to defend itself if under attack. I should say very clearly, I'm an old fashioned liberal. So I would certainly never restrict those ideas from being voiced, for example, in university on this panel. And I would never accuse people who voice these ideas of being anti-Semites in any way. I am not talking about the motive in my next three minutes, but rather the consequences of these ideas. All right, so, uh, 99.5% of the Israeli Jewish population, and I think a large majority of the Jewish population in the diaspora believe that the idea of doing away with the state of Israel and replacing it with some sort of other entity, which would be a state, but would not be an independent Jewish state, is a bad idea and would be extremely harmful to Jews and their supporters. Now, it's possible that this view is incorrect, but for the time being, this is the view that is shared by these people. Now, in the science, in the area of minority studies, which I do a lot of work, one of the welcome, and I think Bernie actually touched on this to a certain extent, 
Um, what, one of the new innovations in this field is we, we tend to listen to, we are told to listen to and pay attention to the claims of the minorities. So if people who are racialized minorities, the indigenous populations, LGBTQ populations, uh, women, people say, you know, we find this policy offensive. We find this view offensive. We think that we will be harmed by this view. We do not dismiss that concern, but we have to take it seriously and recognize its validity. And I think therefore that just as we would do this with all the other minority groups I just mentioned, I think it behooves us to consider doing this for Jews. I can tell you that on the McGill campus, many times I have met with students who have told me that they feel unsafe and unwelcome at McGill, certainly unsafe and unwelcome in progressive spaces at McGill, and they are worried about their security. Now, how to respond to this? Well, I think one responds to it by, by taking it seriously and by uh, trying to see if there are steps that can be taken to make university a safer space. And I know that in Toronto, of course, there's a recent flare up at, at uh, U of T Scarborough, and these things happen not only here, but in Toronto, but everywhere else. So the first point I would say is we have to take this concern that is overwhelmingly the view of the majority of Jews seriously and not try to dismiss it as some sort of political ploy or what have you. Maybe we'll get into that later. The second point I would make, and I, and I make this point very simply, is that Jews have to be, one hopes that the, the, the Zionist perspective, the Jewish case, will be treated as all other countries are. In other words, the, the, the treatment of Israel in the world community, in the academic community, scholarly community, should be the same as the treatment of other countries. Bernie mentioned Canada committing genocide with regard to indigenous peoples. So the position there is simply that if Israel is held to a standard which is not applied to other countries, the word for that is discrimination. That is the word for what that is. And therefore, that can also be seen as one of the factors which make many diaspora Jews and, of course, Israelis see this anti-Zionism as a de facto kind of anti-Semitism. Now, this can be debated and discussed, but I try to pr pr present that view, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Nestel. Okay, it, it's great to be here in front of my congregation where I have been a member for 31 years. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be able to speak uh, to you all about uh, issues that concern me. Um, I want to start by saying that no matter what our political opinions here, we all here take anti-Semitism seriously. Um, what I would like to do in my five minutes, actually six minutes, uh, is to raise my concern with the adequacy and the transparency of the data that seems to be triggering what feels like a panic about anti-Semitism uh, in the Canadian Jewish community. So I want to share with you some of the research that I've been doing this year on the B'nai B'rith Canada Aud Annual Audit of Anti-Semitic Incidents. This is a document which is widely cited in the press and government reports by Canadian organizations. Um, the 2020 audit, which is the most recent one, reported 2,610 anti-Semitic events in Canada. 95% uh, of the incidents were categorized as harassment and 71% of these occurred online. Um, as a respected University of Toronto sociologist and Darche Noah member, Robert Brim reports in a recent article, a single tweet reported to B'nai B'rith Canada and identified as anti-Semitic counts as an incident. Anybody who's ever been on Twitter knows how many tweets can uh, emerge from a single topic. Um, aside from the few examples cited in the audit, B'nai B'rith offers almost no information about the incidents, including who, the, who were the perpetrators, how the incidents were documented, and who the victims had been. As Brim points out, the number of anti-Semitic incidents reported to B'nai B'rith increased significantly with the institution of their 24-hour-a-day hotline, and more recently, uh, 
with their uh, digital reporting mechanism online. But Asprim, incidents of what? He concludes that this rise in incidents can probably be attributed to some degree to the conflation of anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic and anti-Israel acts. And I'll return to this in a minute. Uh, in the US, similar audit of anti-Semitism is conducted yearly by the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, in their, their 2020 audit, they listed 2,024 incidents of anti-Semitism, including 1,242 incidents of harassment, 751 of vandalism, and 31 of assault, which is incidentally down 49% from 2019. That is 60 fewer incidents of anti-Semitism in the US than in Canada in the same period. The discrepancy between the two reports is significant. First, the Jewish population of the US is 15 times larger than that of Canada. So why would Canada, which is a much smaller Jewish population, experience 30% more anti-Semitic incidents? Indeed, according to the ADL, Canada has one of the lowest rates of anti-Semitism in the world. The explanation here is that B'nai B'rith, unlike the ADL, uses the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism, which Bernie mentioned before, to identify anti-Semitic events. This has led to a conflation of anti-Semitism with any strong criticism of Israel. This conflation is the subject of much contentious debate, including within the Jewish world itself. And this is something that isn't often uh, talked about. Many see the IHRA WDA as a threat to freedom of expression, academic freedom, and to the right of Palestinians to publicly narrate their decades long struggle for justice. Earlier this year, we saw the release of the Jerusalem Declaration on anti-Semitism um, on which I worked, by the way, endorsed by over 400 of the world's most eminent Jewish studies and Holocaust scholars. In contrast to the IHRA definition, the JDA proposes that the following do not constitute anti-Semitism. One, support for Palestinian demands for justice and human rights. Two, criticism of Israel as a form of nationalism or arguing for arrangements which accord full equality to all inhabitants between the river and the sea and endorsement of nonviolent protests, such as the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign. Last Friday, the Canadian Association of University Teachers, represented, representing 72,000 workers in higher education, voted unanimously to reject the adoption of the IHRA on university campuses. Uh, despite claims to the contrary, the IHRA definition does not enjoy universal consensus. Its use, is, its use as a tool to overstate the rise of anti-Semitism is at the very least disingenuous. As if to prove a point, Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center declared last week anti-Semitic and demanded action against a demonstration by high school students chanting free Palestine. My final point here has to do with Statistics Canada data on hate crimes. Claims that Jews are the most targeted group in Canada or the amended version that Jews are the most targeted religious group of, for hate crimes, which is the accurate uh, statement may be technically correct when we look at the reported numbers. However, there's a world of obf obfuscation behind these numbers. Between 66 and 90% of hate crimes are not reported to authorities at all. Racialized groups in particular do not report to the police because many members of these communities mistrust the police, believe that they will not be taken seriously or fear reprisals. Police report that only 2% of hate crimes target indigenous people. Anyone who knows anything about the treatment of indigenous peoples in Canada knows the number does not in any way reflect reality. Moreover, 40% of hate crimes committed against Muslims were classified as violent as opposed to 16% of hate crimes against Jews. None of the attacks against Jews resulted in death, but we know that five Muslims were murdered in Canada in apparent hate crimes this year. What must also be acknowledged is that there's almost no evidence that systemic anti-Semitism, a well-documented feature of Canadian history, continues to operate in any significant way. The same cannot be said about systemic racism against black, brown, and indigenous people. I'm concerned that the misuse of anti-Semitism statistics may serve to inure us to the reality of violence and discrimination against other groups. Exaggeration of anti-Semitism threatens to drive a wedge between Jews and those who we need as allies in our common fight against all forms of racism and the overemphasis on equating Palestinian human rights activism with anti-Semitism threatens to deflect our gaze from the growing threat from white supremacy. Placing the blame for anti-Semitism on activists for Palestinian human rights is not only misguided, it is also bound to alienate those progressive forces who are natural allies in the fight against anti-Semitism and all forms of racism. 
Thank you. Um, I now want to, as we see all of the speakers join the screen, um, uh, want to invite anyone, um, if you have any, would like to respond um, to those remarks. Yeah, Mr. Shack. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Um, there's a few things that I'd like to address. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that there's nobody here from B'nai B'rith Canada to talk about their own methodology and, and what goes into that report. I'm not familiar with how, uh, what's in, the, in their, their, uh, their sauce. And, uh, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that there's nobody uh, who can speak with, with inside and understanding uh, from their perspective vantage point. Um, but I will say that um, the notion that um, any issues of methodology are, are due exclusively to the use of the IRA definition, I think is a little bit oversimplified. Um, the IRA definition clearly has a, a, a caveat, a clear caveat, that, a, that expressions of criticism of Israel, similar to that leveled against any other country, cannot be considered anti-Semitism. Um, it's not some definition that was written on the back of a napkin. Uh, it's, it also involved uh, scholars uh, and experts. It's been endorsed not only by dozens of governments around the world, including several here in Canada, uh, but by the United Nations, the European Union, um, uh, many different uh, organizations and institutions. Um, and, and I think it, it oversimplifies things to lay every, perhaps, uh, um, uh, misapplication of, of anti-Semitism at its feet. I think that that is uh, untrue, and and um, it is it is a, a genuine effort to address anti-Semitism. Nothing more. Is it perfect? I don't think anything is perfect. There's no such thing as a definition that's going to capture everything. But in this case, I think that uh, having something that is context contingent and open-ended and a working definition actually serves us well as a, a framework for beginning to interrogate whether something constitutes anti-Semitism uh, and to try to understand it, um, because it, it, it does reflect the lived experience of many people and, and what they're facing. Um, I, I also want to just mention that if we are holding murder up as the litmus test of whether we should take something seriously as anti-Semitism, we're setting a pretty low bar. Um, you know, and, and, and violence is not only confined to the far right. Look at the attacks in Europe that I referenced. Uh, not all of them are perpetrated by neo-Nazis. Um, many uh, have been perpetrated by, by um, uh, Muslim extremists and others. And it's not as though violence even here in Canada is only perpetrated by white supremacists um, when they're targeting Jews. Um, a man wearing a kippah walking his dog at Young and Edmonton uh, this summer. Uh, is beaten in the street and his attacker stands over him, calls him a dirty Jew and shouts free Palestine as he walks away. This is not white supremacist violence. It's anti-Semitism targeting him because he's wearing a kippah and uh, because of an attitude uh, holding him accountable for perceived uh, injustice. When a middle school student returns to school following an absence for Yom Kippur, and is viciously bullied with death threats, along with similar statements about free Palestine, that's anti-Semitic violence. That's not uh, white supremacist violence necessarily. That's something that needs to be taken seriously. Um, but even the focus on violence does us a disservice. It's not just about physical violence or threats. It's about our place in society. Um, we have um, civil servants organizing and becoming activists and, and Forgive me to all the civil servants on the line. This is not a group that's genu generally known as sort of radical rabble rousers who are, are taking a case forward to the Privy Council office because they are being discriminated against. Bernie, you know full well the exclusion of anti-Semitism from equity, diversity, inclusion efforts at Global Affairs Canada. And that is not the exception. That's been the rule. And I think, you know, just as much as we're, we're caring about physical violence and, and these threats, we have to be concerned about how welcome Jews are uh, and how much we're getting being gaslit when our community calls out acts of anti-Semitism targeting us. We have to care about the denial, the erasure, the refusal for people to take a moment and reflect and examine their blind spots 
and to take our the impact that words and actions have on us at face value. We have to people we people have to let us call out our own oppression and center on the impact of what's happened to us rather than the intent of the person who has undertaken some action. This is all regularly withheld, often with a tokenized Jewish voice put forward to, to, to affirm the position that's been taken, uh, or an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory about us just simply uh, advancing a hidden political agenda. Um, uh, um, I, I'm, getting, I'm, getting the, I'm getting the hook, so I'll stop. Thank you. Um, because we're responding uh, and all of the participants have raised their hand, uh, I'm going to go in the order in which you originally spoke as opposed to the order in which I saw your hands, uh, if that is okay. Um, and so in that case, uh, Mr. Farber, would you like to respond? Yeah. Um, just, just a couple of things. Actually, I, I think murder is a pretty high bar as opposed to a low bar. I, I, I get now what, what, what you're saying in, 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 relation, in, in relation to that. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in the uh, allegation that was made vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, Jewish guy with a kippa who uh, was walking his dog and was beaten up and by a guy who allegedly yelled free Palestine. Um, this was a, an issue that made a lot of public news. And yet it's, it's an allegation. We don't know, for example, whether or not that person was uh, an Islamist, uh, quote unquote, whether that person was a neo-Nazi, uh, whether that person was just a plain old Jew hater who decides to throw in free Palestine because he knows that that's going to, you know, give that extra zhuzh to the Jews. We also don't actually know exactly what happened. Police are still investigating. I don't believe any charges have been laid. And so I think that we have to be very careful when we're using examples such as those and, and label them one way or another. We simply just don't know. Where I do agree with you, where I do agree with you is that society in general, especially when it comes to government and, and, and other institutions, are attempting to erase Jewish experience. All of a sudden, we become part of the general society, and anti Semitism, writ large, is no longer seen as an obstacle for Jews. And we all know that that's simply not true. The example that you gave in uh, you know, Global Affairs Canada is absolutely true right across the board. And it is actually true in, in, in racialized settings as well, where uh, myself and people like Dr. Karen Mock and others have had to fight very hard for people to understand that anti-Semitism, yes, still exists. Yes, on the left and on the right. And yes, has to be part of the, um, uh, uh, you know, of, of the discriminatory understanding of, uh, uh, you know, of what racism anti-Semitism, homophobia, Islamophobia, it's all part of the same concentric circle. So we have a lot of work to do, but we have to do it with exceedingly great care and not lay out allegations and say, ah, this was obviously not a neo-Nazi, this was something else. We just don't know. Thank you. Professor Weinfeld? Sure, thanks. A couple of quick points. Uh, by the way, Cheryl, I read your uh, paper. I found it very helpful. Uh, I read Robert Grimm's uh, similar paper, also very helpful. Um, so, uh, but I, I want to just raise the question of how 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 useful will it be to argue over the statistical approaches to measuring anti-Semitism, the quantitative approach, whether it's using large survey data of the Canadian population, and I can talk about the ADL rankings and all that. We don't have time for that or even focusing on those incidents that just were talked about by Noah and Bree, these, these, these high profile sort of incidents. So here's a, here's a thought question. Supposing that we had survey data from Europe in 1910 from three countries, let's say France, Germany, and Russia. And we asked all of these uh, people responding to the survey, which of these three countries is most anti-Semitic and which of these three countries is likely in, in two or three decades to have an explosion whereby they will destroy millions of Jews? I don't, I, I don't know how they would have answered. I'm not convinced Germany would have been ranked number one as the most dangerous threat to Jews, which is a way of saying that, you know, rather than focus on these measures, I think it's important to focus on the discourse in a society. And, and that's something that came up here. Like, 
And I think just to make a final second point, it's in the progressive community that at least on campus and in many intellectual circles, and you quoted the CAUT uh, uh, vote, that there is less and less space for supporters of Israel's right to exist and for Jews as well, including those who support Israel's right to exist. Whether it's throwing Jewish groups out of gay pride marches, or whether it's the kind of uh, difficulty that the Green Party felt and, and leader Anami Paul felt here in a Canadian election. And the, the, the issue of Israel and Zionism troubled the Green Party way before this election. But so those are, are kinds of issues that you can't really get at, I don't think by statistical surveys, but they shape the general uh, challenge. And I would call it, can there be a space found for Jews in progressive circles in Canada today? How do we get that? Can we get that? Especially if those Jews also support Israel's right to exist. So I think that's all I'll say. Thank you, Professor Nestel. Hey, uh, where do I begin? Uh, in response to Noah, um, one of the differences between the ADL uh, audit and the B'nai B'rith audit is that the ADL audit is very detailed and it has, it lists all the incidents. It has a very detailed methodology section the, you said that, you know, that that's the IHRA um, example that I gave in terms of the methodology of, of B'nai B'rith is neither here nor there. The fact of the matter is that that is the only methodological statement in the entire B'nai B'rith report, that they base all their judgments on whether an incident is anti-Semitic or not on the IHRA. So we know nothing about the methodology other than they use the IHRA. So I think we can maybe put that to bed a bit. Um, the second thing, I know one of the arguments that people who support the IHRA always make is that it states explicitly within the IHRA that it's not anti-Semitic to criticize Israel. I mean, you can say that, but the way the IHRA has been used, and if anybody's interested in seeing the myriad examples of how it has been used to silence speech around Palestine, they can go to www.ijv.org and see the running tally that we've been keeping of these incidents. One of the most egregious um, locales, one of the locales that is most egregiously using the IHRA to silence criticism in Israel is Germany. Um, but the UK is a close second on that. Um, and I, so I think that there are many, many examples how, of how it is being used uh, to do that despite protestations, you know, in the opposite direction. Um, I want to say a, a thing about something about Jewish experience. I want to recommend to everybody a very, very important paper that came out not long ago. It's called Arguing About Anti-Semitism, Why We Disagree About Anti-Semitism and What We Can Do About It by Dove Waxman, who is a very well-respected Jewish sociologist, uh, David Schraub and Adam Hussein, and it's in the um, Ethnic and Racial Studies uh, Journal. Um, anybody can email me if they want more. It's, it's uh, published August 13, 2021. Um, they make the point, and I think it's very important, that experience is not, people's interpretation of their experience is not absolute. It is not absolute evidence that's, that, that, you know, a, you know a, 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 that something egregious or something bad has happened to them. We all interpret our experience in various ways. I, if there are Jews who are saying that, anti-Zionism or critique of Israel is, is anti-Semitic. And I say the opposite, which Jew are you gonna believe? You know, who gets to be the authoritative Jew? I think that's a very important question and that there is masses of studies on Jewish interpretations of anti-Semitism and, and what gets influenced by that. And, uh, you know, I'm not gonna go into great detail at quoting those. Um, the, uh, I, I wanna say one thing about, um, about the question of Jewish students' um, sense of safety or lack of that on campus. Um, the other thing that you see also in the B'nai B'rith report, there are allegations that Jewish students are under siege on campus. Um, there, to my knowledge, is no empirical evidence of this. There's never, never been a study done. The studies that have been done in the States, other than the really methodologically bad ones, like from the Brandeis Institute, um, that say that 99% of Jewish students experience anti-Semitism, 
um, the, the ones that are decently, that are methodologically decent, say that Jewish students don't feel particularly uh, under siege on campuses. Even in the most you know, radical campuses like UC Berkeley and Stanford, et cetera. Um, the, uh, so I think that's, that's really important. I'm right now involved in a, in a research study of the repression of speech and harassment around speech on Palestine uh, on campuses and in, uh, in, in the community. <coughs> Um, we've interviewed 77 um, pro-Palestine uh, activists and, and prof mostly professors and students. Um, the number of incidents that, that we've found there and the extreme harassment that's happening mostly at the hands of Jewish institutions is very, very um, hard to relate to you. It's, it's, it's shocking. Um, and beyond that, there is, a, there is, and this is really scary for me in academia, there is a, the chilling effect that this is having on scholarship, on speech, is, is very disturbing. Um, I'm hoping to have this report out by February, but um, people are, are abandoning the study. People who are interested in studying about Palestine are abandoning it because they have, been, they have been told that you will get nowhere, you will be harassed. The number of harassing incidents that have to do with hirings on campus are very uh, disturbing as well. So I think that we really have to, uh, uh, we have to, we, if you're going to make the point that Jews, Jewish students are being harassed on campus, show me the money. I, I wanna see the evidence. I wanna see the empirical evidence and not just people saying, I'm scared because there's a Palestinian flag um, you know, in the quad that I don't wanna to have to confront. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I wanna pose the question uh, in part because I told the, um, panelists that I would pose this one. Um, and it's a question about what has changed, right? Why are we having this event now? And what I'd like to encourage the panelists to think about is, if I think about my own memories, if we go back 21 years, so before 9-11, right, year 2000, a religious Jew is running on the ticket of a major party in America to be vice president. And Maybe I was naive, but I remember feeling like it wasn't a, that big of a deal for a lot of people and that there was this unprecedented level of acceptance. And so the question is, what has changed between 2000 and now, if anything has changed? And is there, if what has changed, does that have an unusual trajectory in Canada? Or is what's happening in Canada over the last 20 odd years roughly the same as what we see elsewhere. Professor Weinfeld, do you want to start with that? Oh, uh, sure. Um, change, yeah, I, I think, by the way, you're right to emphasize the importance of the Joe Lieberman uh, vice presidential campaign. Uh, most of my students have never heard of that or don't know about that. And I sometimes point out to them that in a way, Joe Lieberman helped break the ground for Barack Obama. So that gives it some relevance uh, for them. Um, I think American Jews, for a variety of reasons, which we can't go into now, are much more integrated politically than Canadian Jews are in Canada. So I think, and, and that isn't simply the Lieberman phenomenon. For the longest time, as you, as you may know, 10% of US senators were Jewish. And they came from, from places that were not very uh, Jewish. Even Joe Lieberman from Connecticut, you know, 3% of the Connecticut population was Jewish. So there, there was this high degree of integration. In Canada, we, we're just not there yet. Uh, maybe in another generation, we will be there, but we're not there yet. And again, there are all sorts of possible explanations for this in terms of immigration recency, et, et cetera. But uh, the Green Party episode in, in this last election, I think is, is worthy of very detailed research and analysis to see exactly what went on there. One last point I'll mention in terms of, you know, I guess people have uh, relate to their experiences on campus differently. Uh, my experience is that, um, that at least from my students, uh, since you're talking about an incidence, uh, I teach a course on suspect minorities in Canada, and one of the better students, a non-Jewish student, came up to me after class and says, said to me, so what do I think about Norman Finkelstein? And 
I was sort of surprised that this student had heard of him and, and knew of him. And, you know, I, I said, look, uh, off the record, because, you know, I, I, we're not in the classroom setting. I said, I'm not a fan. And, and then I welcome the student to discuss this further. Other students have come to me and they have said, again, you know, I, di I didn't take down their names, Cheryl, I can't, but they have been real students who have been really upset. And, and they were upset exactly because they saw themselves as progressive, but they felt that they were no longer welcome in progressive spaces because either they were Jewish or they were seen as somewhat sympathetic to Israel. Um, you mentioned this vote by the CAUT, which uh, was unanimous, I think you said, in rejecting the era uh, definition of anti-Semitism. So that doesn't sound like the campus is, is that hostile to criticism of Israel. Uh, my own sense of it is that it is actually quite, many professors are quite open in, in their readiness to criticize Israel, sometimes very harshly. So maybe, maybe you know, we're looking at an elephant, but touching different parts. I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. Anyone else? Bernie? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm having a little difficulty here, and maybe uh, Noah or, or, or others can help me out. I'm trying to understand where the deflection point comes between anti-Semitism, as we understand classical anti-Semitism, absolute Jew hatred, to anti-Israelism. Uh, when, when does that conflation actually begin? Because I have to tell you from my vantage point, I'm not on campus. Uh, my kids are, are now off campus for five or six years. They did not feel unsafe on campus. And yet students I have spoken to have said to me exactly that thing, that they do feel at times unsafe on campus. When I question that, the issue is not that they, 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 they feel they're going to be attacked because they're wearing a kippah or they're going to be attacked because they're Jews. It all comes down to Israel-Palestine. They, and I think somebody mentioned it, you know, they, they, they fear confronting a Palestinian flag uh, on campus. Or, for example, what happened here during, uh, during the, 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 uh, the Gaza incursion here in Thornhill in Bonn, there was a car that drove down, if you, if you, if you know Toronto, that drove north uh, up Bathurst Street right into Vaughan, flying a Palestinian flag. And there were a number of Jewish organizations that said, this was a deliberate anti-Semitic event attack. I don't feel the same way. I mean, this per it was a very touchy time, obviously. The person was being obviously provocative. There's no question about that. But he was flying a Palestinian flag. And I, 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 I really have difficulty understanding how that gets labeled as anti-Semitism. Let me add one last thing to actually counter my own argument to a certain extent. As a Jew, as a son of a Holocaust survivor, I understand Jewish trauma. I think we have a right to our Jewish trauma. They tried to get rid of us and they almost succeeded. Two thirds of a European Jewry were murdered. And so we can carry that paranoia with us. We have an absolute right to do that. And so when we are perceived as being attacked, so my, my fellow citizens in, in, in Thornhill who saw that Palestinian flag uh, have, have interpreted it as an attack on them as Jews. And they feel that deeply and I get it, but I think that we have to sometimes take a few steps back. When is it anti-Semitism, and when is it not anti-Semitism? And by the way, there are times as Mort has said and others where anti-Zionism is definitely anti-Semitism. They definitely conflate, they definitely come together. But for Palestinians who cry, for example, free Palestine, some Jews feel that as a threat to them and their livelihood. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. There are many Jews, and I understand this, who see this as a threat to all of Israel, to Jews all over Israel. I get it. It's part of our trauma. But I think we have to also be very cognizant of words and very cognizant of political action and what one means and what another means. This is a difficult contextual thing to do. But I think as Jews, as modern Jews, we have to stop. As I said, it's not always black and white. We have to stop. We have to think, is this anti-Semitism? Is this anti-Israelism? Is this, is this something that is going to personally uh, affect me as a, as a Jew? Where does it end and where does it begin? So Renan, if I could, Bernie invited me to, to uh, help him out on, on, on this question and, and I'm happy to do so. Look, 
the issue with uh, the cars, because it wasn't just a one-off that, that drove up uh, into to Jewish neighborhoods, wasn't that there was a Palestinian flag, Bernie. It's that when they, and I'm, albeit I'm further south from you, and I don't know if it was the same person, but when they drove, uh, when somebody drove into the neighborhood where I live and started shouting epithets out their window while waving a Palestinian flag at visibly Jewish families, at mothers and children in their front yards. And I don't think anybody would dispute that harassing somebody because they're Jewish yep. uh, is anti-Semitism. And when there's a concerted campaign to have negative Google uh, reviews targeting businesses along the Bathurst Street corridor, Jewish and not Jewish alike, um, that, that's, that's something that is concerning. And, and I think if we simplify it down to, well, they were waving a Palestinian flag and people were triggered unjustifiably, um, we're, we're missing key details from what happened. We're missing the fact that there were people walking up to uh, um, Hasidic Jews uh, at Bathurst and Lawrence and harassing them in the streets. Uh, in no, the, in just, the, just, no, just no, with, with, with respect, we're talking about different incidents, so we have to be careful. Everyone that you mentioned, that to me, those are anti-Semitic incidents. Okay, so the but car, a person the, flying a flag, a per, just flying the, car, the flags. Sure, that, well, uh, but, but, but that wasn't just a person flying a flag. It was a person it, it, gearing towards people. It was a person shouting at people. Not true. Well, well, that was that was not, that's not that's not what I understood. Those were the the, the cases that were reported into uh, UJ Community Security that were verified and followed up on and were brought to the police attention. So I can't speak to what you heard about in your neighborhood. I can only speak to the ones that the institutional community took seriously and and carried Fair forward enough. in a serious way. Um, uh, really? And 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 I think I, sorry, Renan, one. Um, uh, other point Bernie had asked about where does where does the line come in? I think it's pretty simple. Um, throughout the ages, anti-Semitism, if we're drilling it down, if we're getting rid of definitions that had context and, and gray, um, anti-Semitism has always been about this sense of Jews being some sort of cosmic evil, as some sort of a yeah. representation or answer to why do bad things happen? Why in my personal life, in my national uh, context, whatever. And when you're applying um, language or standards on Jews, when you're talking about Israel, uh, not from a position of thoughtful uh, interrogation of some policy, but just ascribing evil to Israel, you are uh, demonizing it. Uh, and, and that is uh, uh, where I think um, most people would start to draw that line. When you start rejecting Jewish self-determination in our ancestral homeland. Not saying that Palestinians have a right to self-determination as well. Mm -hmm. Not saying free Palestine, which can, you know, free Palestine on its own outside of context. I want a free Palestine living next to a, a free Israel, a two-state solution and peace and security. Okay, it can mean different things. But it also is an epithet that's shouted um, uh, when when somebody is standing over somebody they've just knocked to the ground and bloodied. And, and um, uh, you know, it's not my question. I'm not questioning the intent of that person. I'm measuring the impact on the Jew who's been assaulted. And I think that, um, you know, we, 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 you know, we can, we can, you know, that that's really where the line gets drawn, the double standards that get applied, things like that. Um, and, and I think it's, 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 it's not as uh, opaque as, as some would, uh, would, would uh, have us believe, but I don't want to, I don't want to take up too much time. I know Renan wants to yeah, I, I, I will actually want to pivot a, a little bit, although I think it's certainly related to the points that you were making there. Um, and and it's, it's a question that we had prepared, but um, audience member named Marty Klein uh, has asked perhaps better than I had articulated it. Um, and this has to do with the connections between anti-Semitism as a form of hate and other forms of hate. Um, Mr. Klein asks, how do you differentiate between anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and racism directed at um, black and native people. How connected are these? Professor Nestle, do you want to start us on that? Yeah. Um, can I can I pick up first on uh, I'll get I'll get to it in a second, I promise. Um, I think that when we have a Jewish community that is intent on um, proving that Jews and Israel are one and the same, which is what we in fact have, um, we shouldn't really be surprised that that uh, 
that Jews get attacked because there's a presumption of a connection to Israel. Um, the other thing I want to say is that the, 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 this fear, this fear of Palestinians, this fear of the Palestinian flag, this fear of slogans. Um, you know, one of the things that we see, and I follow this really closely, is that the institutional Jewish community often is calls things like the Batellan report on apartheid and the human rights watch report. They're lies, lies, and lies. Um, how, to me, this is a really foolish uh, uh, response to these things rather than confronting them uh, in reality. These aren't lies. These are human rights organizations that do incredible work. Um, let's face the reality of what Israel is doing to Palestinians. Uh, I think if we decided to do that, we might see a lot less of the kinds of incidents that we're talking about. In terms of the, of, of the, um, the, the relationship between anti-Semitism and other forms of racism, I would say absolutely there is a connection. Uh, and if you look historically, these, 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 uh, these forms of discrimination and hatred actually come into being in and through one another um, in many, many different ways. And I, I would disagree with Noah that, that anti-Semitism is this overarching thing that is always gonna be there and is never gonna go away, et cetera. And, you know, this is what the, the, the great Jewish historian Saul Baron called the lacrimose history of of, of, of anti-Semitism. In fact, every era has anti-Semitism for its own reasons and it's in its own very specific context. And we have to look at that uh, as well here. Um, I think that, you know, to, to get into Marty's point, Marty Klein, who raised that, um, one of the things that bothers me is, is, is the, the danger of exceptionalizing anti-Semitism within a context where racism is such a problem. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I can only imagine the message that gets conveyed when I read the headline from B'nai B'rith, Jews the most targeted group in Canada. Um, you know, if I were a, you know, a Muslim who's, whose mosque had been attacked, or who, uh, you know, who was, was mourning the deaths of the four uh, Muslim members of, of the family in, in, uh, in London, Ontario, I would kind of, I would roll my eyes, to be honest with you. Um, I think that we have to look at these forms of hate together. We have to fight them together. Um, and exceptionalizing is a, is a very bad idea and it will not get us, I think, to where we want to be, which is the reduction of hate um, across the board for everyone. Professor Weinfeld, your hand is up. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, Bernie raised the question of the Holocaust. So I tell my students that if you want to understand the, the anti-Semitism, even today, you've got to understand the link with the Holocaust. The Holocaust is an event which shapes the Jewish sensibility. And it doesn't matter how well Jews are doing on other indicators in Canada in terms of social economic status or what have you. The Holocaust remains omnipresent in many ways. Now, you can use labels like paranoia or, or trauma to, to, to sort of say, well, of course, don't you realize that Canada today is very different from, from Germany? And of course, it's very different. But I think for many Jews, and I'll just give two quick examples, well, give one major example. When, when Israel was worried about uh, you know, the, the Iranian bomb and they, are, they continue to be worried about the Iranian bomb. That became a very hot political issue. Well, there, were, there was a lot of discourse in the Jewish world about 1938. Are we living in 1938 again? Now you could say that discourse was paranoid or however you want to frame it, or maybe it was uh, prescient, it's hard to know. But what I'm saying is the, the Holocaust is that foundation. Another quick, uh, and by the way, this is not unique to Jews. Many other minority groups very rightly have these historical traumas like the Nakba or like uh, you know, the conquest of 1759 that shaped their future discourse. So this is not unique uh, to the Jews. Um, on the question of Israel-Palestine, you know, from the river to the sea, as Bernie quoted it, there was just recently an article in the New York Review of Books by a, a Palestinian intellectual. And this is becoming 
the predominant discourse among many Palestinian and Arab intellectuals, not necessarily the governments of some countries, but among intellectuals, again, from the river to the sea. And this article in the New York Review of Books simply makes the case there is no real difference between pa Palestinian life in Israel and Palestinian life in the West Bank. It's all part of the same colonizing project. Now, I happen to disagree with that view, but that's not, and I speak as a Peace Now supporter, but you know that's not the issue. The issue is this is the dominant discourse that is emerging in the Palestinian community. Now, if that is correct, that this is the dominant discourse that is, in, that is emerging in the Palestinian community, you can then understand the worry and the apprehension among Jews and supporters in general, and Jewish supporters of Israel. You have two very clashing different discourses. And that's why I made my earlier comment about this, you know, we're, we're dealing with the Kulturkampf, with clashes of ideas, rather than counting the number of incidents or the number of people who hold one view over another. That's all I'll say. Thank you, Mr. Shack. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll take the same prerogative as my co-panelists and talk about something else and then get to the question. Um, I think, uh, Cheryl, it, it sounded to me like you were saying before that um, attacks on Jews who identify with Israel are somehow justifiable because of that identity with Israel, identification with Israel. Uh, okay, so, so then I, I got it wrong, but I, I do think that it's important to, to note that you know, we've heard a lot of uh, accolades for Bob Brim. Uh, I, I, I happened to see his, his, his wonderful wife earlier this evening, um, and the two of them uh, co-authored a, a, a study of Jews in Canada in 2018. Uh, and, and it found that the vast majority of Jews in this country, uh, connection with Israel is a core component of their uh, Jewish identity. And that has to be respected. And I think that's an important thing that we should uphold. It also showed that more than 40% of Jews in the GTA downplay their Jewish identity in public and go into the closet, uh, which is higher than the national average, despite our, our very diverse um, uh, uh, and, and open and tolerant society within which we live and, and, and the most vibrant Jewish community arguably in the country. Um, on the question that's been asked, I think it's dangerous for us to get into some kind of oppression Olympics. This is not a zero sum phenomenon. If you look at hate crime in general over the last decade, it has been steadily rising. Um, and if we're thinking about Jewish reporting, Jewish community reporting of hate crime, uh, for sure we have a different relationship with police than some other uh, racialized communities, absolutely. Our experience is not predominantly violent crime. That's a fact. But it's also a fact that many in our community will not report to police because they don't believe that um, the reports will be taken seriously or um, for or, or other reasons. And it's a, an ongoing challenge to communicate to our community that when a, a hate incident or hate crime occurs, they should report it to police. Um, and I think that, uh, that that is something that, that, that's important. But regardless, it actually doesn't matter if we're number one. I don't want to be number one most target of hate crime. It doesn't matter if we're number one or two or three or 10. The reality is these incidents and crimes are occurring. And we are hearing about more and more of them. Uh, I say we, community professionals like myself who are there listening to community, talking to them and helping them on a daily basis deal and handle with handle these situations. We're seeing data come out of the Toronto District School Board, uh, which is the only school board that actually collects uh, racism and hate data uh, on incidents that occur in schools in the province in a meaningful way. Uh, and, and it also shows uh, parallel experiences uh, among Jewish uh, students uh, in, in our school system. Um, uh, you'll, you'll see in that, that data, if we care about who's first, who's second, who's third, anti-Black racism is sky, sky high, um, uh, homophobia is, is next, uh, and then anti-Semitism is the third most uh, um, uh, quantified uh, uh, group. Um, this is a phenomenon, and, and we just received a report this evening that came out uh, from the Integrity Commissioner at the Toronto District School Board 
that affirmed that the Human Rights Office at the TDSB um, has been deficient in, with regard to addressing anti-Semitism. And so I think, you know, this is a real phenomenon. What, what is actually happening is real and it needs to be addressed. Who is the most targeted? Who is the most viciously targeted? Um, it's important, but you know, when I'm thinking about the imperative to address anti-Semitism, number one, it goes hand in hand with addressing all forms of hate because we're not going to succeed in getting rid of anti-Semitism if we're not looking at the full spectrum of hate that exists in our society. We have to do this together. But at the same time, we have to rec recognize the particularities of how each form of hatred manifests in our society and address those particularities. Um, this is not a competition. This is something that we have to come together around. And it's not helpful to, to frame it in terms of who's really first, who's really worst. Um, Anti-Semitism is a real problem. I think we all agree on that and needs to be addressed. Um, uh, on its own, but also within that broader framework. Okay, thank you. Um, I, uh, Mr. Farber, I see your hand, but I had one last question and then there are some questions in the chat that I'm hoping we will have at least a little bit of time for. Um, and uh, the question is, is we've talked a lot about the problem and I want to make sure that before we go, we have a chance to talk about a solution. And all of you have been in various ways engaged in ways of combating anti-Semitism. So what I'd like to make sure we have a chance to do is to be able to ask, well, what do we do? How do we respond? And hopefully we will still have time to be able to take a few more questions. Thank you. Mr. Farber, do you wanna start with that? Sorry, yeah, I, I will actually. Um... Uh, I've always held that the, the best weapon really to deal with uh, anti-Semitism is, in my view, education. Uh, and education beginning not in university and not even in high school, but education uh, beginning in, uh, in, in public schools, in, in, in elementary schools. Uh, Anti-racism workshops, workshops on anti-Semitism, starting with teachers, <laughs> and I, I know that sounds a little uh, silly, but uh, teachers being able to identify what is anti-Semitic, what isn't anti-Semitic, how, how students are being radicalized, when they're being radicalized. We had an incident and, and uh, no one others will, 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 will know of this in, in North Bay, uh, in a Catholic school where a group of students, grade eight students, believe it or not, uh, were marching up and down the field. They had filmed themselves, they put it on TikTok and they were yelling Zieg Heil as they were doing so and death to the Jews and all kinds of other things. This is in 2021. At the same time, you know, just a few years earlier, we had a march in, in, in Charlottesville. I mean, this wasn't Skokie where a bunch of stupid neo-Nazis, uh, you, you know, terrorize a community, uh, you know, what, 30 or 40 years after the Holocaust. This was in 2017, 300 Nazis marching down the main street of Charlottesville, screaming, Jews will not replace us. So we're not talking 1940 or 1950. We're not talking the Heritage Front. We're talking about young people. Some of them are college students. Some of them quite well educated, marching in right. the United so, States of so, America. So, if, so if, I can, if I can force us into this question, so, so what, what do we do? How, how do we, re do only, we want to the, reach those people? Do we want to reach those people okay, there that are, those there we are, are trying to reach? Yeah, I, I understand. And, and the only time to reach them is when they're young. If we're trying to reach them when they're in university, we failed miserably. And so dealing with anti-Semitism is having people understand what it is, having people understand what, what Judaism and Jews are all about. And that has to begin in, in public schools. It has to begin with educated teachers. And it has to begin with un, you know, uh, understanding as a society that Jews play a, a significant role here and, and how we are able to deal with that Jew to Jew, non-Jew to non-Jew, working with people of color, working with the Muslim community, bringing Muslims and Jews together, for example, would be a, a, a wonderful thing. We face similar pains and we face similar discrimination, but we don't talk to each other. So talking to each other, educating each other, that's the trick, but we have a long way to go. Hey, thank you. Uh, Mr. Shack, and then Professor Nestle. 
Thank you. Um, I, I agree. Uh, I agree with Bernie. Education is the key. We're seeing children in middle school um, uh, in, engaged in anti-Semitic activity, uh, sucked into being radicalized by social media and online gaming platforms. Uh, it's alarming. The pandemic has escalated this, and uh, you know, North Bay was one, Manitoulin Island was another, and there have been three others in the region and uh, Northern Ontario in the last couple of weeks. Uh, at the TDSB, uh, there's an average of two anti-Semitic incidents per week since this school year began. Um, in Peel region, I was dealing with a case a few weeks ago where a child had to be removed from a middle school because somebody, she was being bullied and taunted and um, threatened to have a swastika written onto her forehead. Um, this is what's happening in our schools right now. And if we fail to engage in education in the school system today, we are going to see a really scary manifestation of anti-Semitism down the road uh, when, these, when these people come of age. We have an opportunity to change, shape minds in a very positive way right now, but it's not just in the schools. I think every single one of us has an opportunity to help educate people about the anti-Semitism that we're experiencing. This doesn't require you to be an expert on anti-Semitism or, uh, or, or, or have access to all of the, um, the, the knowledge that, uh, that, that uh, some on this panel have, and, and of course, decades of experience more than I do. Um, this this is, requires an authentic voice to be a trusted person and to speak to people in an authentic way about the way that anti-Semitism impacts you and to be courageous enough to have those conversations. And it's not an easy thing, but it's a really important thing right now. Um, and I think centering uh, it around impact is really important. And the third thing that we need is for leaders to speak up. When you have people marching in Charlottesville shouting, the Jews will not replace us. When you have people saying silly things like Jewish space lasers and everybody laughs, but it's not really that funny. Uh, when you have people talking about conspiracy theories of Israel stealing vaccines, um, as one candidate for elected office did here uh, during the last election, um, and other sorts of things that permeate throughout society, when these things happen, people need to speak out and make it clear that they're not acceptable. And I think, um, you know, education is key and being an upstander, not a bystander, is also key uh, in, in making sure that we're able to contain and push back against uh, the anti-Semitism in our midst. Thank you. Professor Nestle? Yeah. Um, I want to, uh, I, one of the things that was brought up at the beginning of this conversation um, was, you know, this kind of this, this division of anti-Semites into left-wing anti-Semites and right-wing anti-Semites. Um, I think that there is a broad swath of left-leaning progressive people in this country in particular. Canadians are extremely sympathetic to the Palestinian um, plea for human rights. Um, if we as a community continue to attack people who speak out for Palestinian human rights, as has as been able consistently and, and Simon Wiesenthal Center consistently does attacking professors like Faisal Baba, who teaches at, law, at the law school at, um, at Osgoode Hall Law School, uh, myself, for example, um, and, and others. Um, I think that what this does is to, um, rather than engage in some kind of conversation, it's an immediate striking out labeling, naming, you know, this here we're seeing again, we're seeing this anti-Semitism again, um, rather than engaging in a dialogue, trying to understand that, trying to understand that this reflects quite a large number of Canadians in terms of their, of their position. Um, if we continue to attack people for this, um, it seems to me that this is something that will exacerbate anti-Semitism. Um, and I think that that's a really important thing to to, to think about as well. Um, you know, there are many, many things we can think of, but education is one of them. And education precludes attacks. 
if you want to educate people, this is something that I've been doing for many years is, is doing work on the left around anti-Semitism. My colleague, uh, Professor Larry Haven and I teach anti-Semitism workshops from an anti-racist and anti-colonial point of view. That's how we describe it. And we've educated many student councils, we've educated academics, we've educated church groups. Um, and, and, you know, rather than bringing the message that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism or criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism, we talk about what you should do so as not to be anti-Semitic in your support of Palestinian human rights. Um, I think this is very important as well. But, but these kind of, these, these ad hominem attacks, these lawsuits, um, the use of lawfare against pro-Palestinian people, this is not going to make anti-Semitism disappear among, you know, among progressives who should be our natural allies in the fight against anti-Semitism and hate. So I just wanna throw my, you know, my two cents in there around that and say that these kinds of attacks really need to stop. And that, that would be somewhat of a help, I think, in this fight. <clears throat> Professor Weinfeld, thank you. Uh, very, very quickly, uh, I, I support the idea of education and it certainly we begin in primary school, but I wanna put in a plug for university education as well. Now, I'm a little hesitant because I know that, I, you know, if you go back to the Third Reich, you know that some of the major supporters of Nazism were educa highly educated Germans. And unfortunately, that's true. However, if you look at campus today, uh, I think there is a role to be played, for example, in, in courses in, in, in Jewish studies. Uh, I know in my class, I, the majority of the students are non-Jewish. Uh, this has been a steady increase. My class is, is certainly not a, a cheerleading class for Jews. It's a sociology class, but it, it, it opens doors. It, it, it increases the bridges. It builds ties. I've been told that many Holocaust courses on, at university have increasing numbers of non-Jewish students taking those courses. So I would argue for education right across the board as a way of, of increasing the contact and increasing the understanding. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Fridel Brief who asked uh, along these lines of uh, how do we respond and what do we do? Uh, she asks, how can we build peace between supporters of Palestinians and supporters of Israel without the othering of people with whom you disagree? Anyone wanna take that? If, if I can just give a plug for the concept of dialogue, um, that, that's how we bridge that gap. So we have an interesting situation here in Canada, and, and I mentioned it just at the end of my last comments, where we have two significant minority groups, the Jewish community and the Muslim community, traveling these separate but parallel roads. They disagree with each other passionately on issues of Palestine, Israel, but we're living here in Canada, and yet very rarely, it's only been recently that, that Jews and Muslims institutionally have begun to recognize each other, but we still have a long way to go. Can you imagine uh, the, the, I don't know, uh, you know, how helpful it would be to bring Jews and Muslims together to talk about threats to both communities? Uh, yes, we can talk about the elephant in the room down the road as well. I think part of the whole issue around uh, uh, Muslim-Jewish dialogue in the past is that we used to bring rabbis and imams together and they would discuss kosher and halal food and the, the pink elephant in the room never got discussed and that was Palestine, Israel. I think that we have to engage in this, these helpful forms of dialogue with other communities as well. But because we face uh, such threats together and yet don't speak together about such threats, the power of dialogue we, we, we can never be underrated. So we have work to do, whether it's CJA and the National Council of Canadian Muslims or other groups, bringing these groups together to have formal discussions and dialogue leading to eventually some discussion on our political differences where we will probably agree to disagree. And we may passionately agree to disagree, but as Canadians, that's what we do. We're allowed to do that. Let's find areas of convergence as well, especially where there are threats because we can learn so much from each other and there still is strength in numbers. Thank you, Mr. Schacht. So, so these dialogues have have existed, and and uh, um, they've been they've run hot and cold for many many years. Um, 
And I and I'd only I'd only push back and say that it's not just on the Israel Palestinian issue that there there can be challenges. Uh, I think that whether you're talking about the Muslim community or frankly almost any other community, there are um, issues around perceptions of Jews, um, prejudice about Jew, preconceived notions of Jewish power, um, and and the like, classic anti-Semitic tropes, if you will, that persist. And they need to be addressed as well, mm -hmm. uh, just like uh, preconceived notions and and biases and things that exist in our community about others. And I think it's 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 it oversimplifies it to make it the only area of disagreement between us is around uh, the Israel Palestinian issue. Um, but I think you know, reflecting on Fredel's question, and, and you know, I, I suspect she has she probably has a better answer than I do because nobody has more experience engaging in interfaith dialogue than Fredel. I don't think. Um, but uh, I, th you know, being intellectually honest and 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 not hypocritical in our engagement is so important. Um, if we're going to expect um, someone to accept that Jews have a right to self determination in our ancestral homeland, which for most of us is a core component of of our Jewish identity, uh, in some fashion. Um, and has been a major part of the Jewish story for decades, um, then we have to acknowledge the right of the Palestinians to self-determination in, in their uh, homeland. And we have to be willing to accept that. And we have to expect that they will be willing to accept our rights as well. There can, in other words, we can't be hypocritical about these things. And I think there needs to be an understanding that mutual recognition is, an, is, an, is a key component for that kind of peace building. Um, uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, of course, is, is an issue that plays out in the Middle East, uh, but, but uh, is on a, on a micro level, uh, an important component of building those, those human interactions here that can help to, to bridge gaps between communities. Hey, thank you. Um, I I, we, we'll, oh, sorry, you wanna say one more thing? May I say please, one thing? Yes, please. That is that mutual recognition can't happen if your foot is on my neck. Uh, and I think that's the message that we're trying to put forward in the politics that I engage in. Um, this, this is not a coming together at the same table of equally positioned uh, individuals. There is, uh, there's something happening in Israel-Palestine that puts Palestinians at a much greater, uh, at, at quite a disadvantage in terms of, rather, much more disadvantaged than Israelis. And this is not an, a, a, a discussion of equals that can happen. It has to, <clears throat> something has to happen before people see each other as equals. Okay, thank you. Um, what I'm anticipating given the hour of the evening will be our last question uh, is one from Simon Shapiro who asks, um, in response to things that were said earlier, how can you interpret from river to the sea, Palestine should be free as anything but a desire to destroy Israel as a Jewish state? I think that was directed at Mr. Farber. Um, but I throw that out to anybody. Uh, well, I'll start. Um, I, I, I happen to agree. Uh, I, I do think that Jews looking at that statement uh, see it as a, uh, as a statement that basically says uh, that part of the world has to be free of Jews. Um, I, I see it that way. And I, I think that Jews who have been through, as, as we've discussed earlier, the kind of trauma that we've experienced in, in, in living memory uh, have every right uh, to see it that way. Uh, so uh, again, I think this, this comes really down to education. I have spoken uh, quite often and quite passionately about my naive dream. And my naive dream really is the continuation of the, the idea of a two-state solution. Noah has spoken about it, uh, Mort has spoken about it, 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 it's, it's something that as Jews, uh, we, we want. I mean, we, 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 we believe in it. Uh, we do want to have a, a state for Jews and a state for Palestinians where they live side by side. It may be a naive today, 
but I still think that there is uh, room for this in, 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 in our thinking and, and room for this internationally. Um, but we, are, we have been so busy really uh, attacking each other and reinterpreting really what is anti-Semitism that we have really taken a, 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 you know, a step back from the common understanding of, of what is necessary. So, you know, I, I, I go back to, to folks like Fridell and I, forgive me Fridell for not saying hello earlier, Fridell and I worked together for years on, on interfaith issues. Uh, I'm an old guy, but I still believe in old ideas. I may be old school around this, um, but I still believe that Jews and Muslims and Palestinians and Christians can find a way to live together. But if you, if you start taking phrases and comments like, from the river to the sea, uh, uh, you know, uh, Palestine shall be free. And you have young kids saying it as they did at the Mark Garno Collegiate with no real, uh, I think, context or understanding, it frightens Jews and it has every right to frighten Jews. Uh, so we have to find, again, I go back to this, we have to find ways to speak together. Uh, no, I agree with you. It, it's not just uh, Israel-Palestine. Obviously there are all kinds of issues that interplay on minority politics. That's the key issue. If we can, if we, if we can start even speaking about that, uh, always understanding the elephant in the room, I think that we can get through context and we could uh, uh, not erase language, but really begin to have people understand what our trauma is and where we have to move from here. Mr. Shack. Thanks. Sorry, Sorry for the glitch. Um, I think when we're talking about from the river to the sea, um, yes, there's that sort of fear and trauma that, that Bernie references, uh, but fundamentally there's, there's, there's a couple of other things at play as well. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna repeat sort of, I think people take that as a, a genocidal statement, but even if you're not talking about uh, pushing Jews into the sea, uh, which some people interpret it as, we're looking at, um, a phrase that negates the possibility of Jewish self-determination in that geographic space. And if that's articulated as an expression in favor of Palestinian self-determination, uh, but a rejection of Jewish self-determination, that's inherently discriminatory and, and uh, problematic. Bernie referenced the students at Mark Arno. I actually don't have a problem with the students. These are students. They're out there protesting. Uh, my big problem, and, and there, is a, there are educational programs that can help bridge that gap and, and help them to understand the impact that those words have on others. Um, the fact that the Toronto District School Board failed to center on the impact on Jewish community in, in, in the context of that incident is something we, we need another evening to talk about, I think. But um, I'm concerned about the staff at the TDSB and, and folks around there who, uh, who affirmed in the face of the Jewish community saying, we experience this as hateful um, or as discriminatory uh, and the impact is problematic for us. It's anti-Semitic to us. The response was, that's BS and you keep doing this, students, because these people are just trying to oppress you. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But it's that reaction to um, situations like this. When we stand up and we expect to be treated like everyone else, when we say this is impacting us in a hateful way, to be respected, to have that considered, to have people examine their blind spots, reflect on it, and then affirm our sense of being attacked um, uh, without necessarily attacking another group of people, but to unequivocally affirm that without at the same time saying, but they didn't mean it that way. So, you know, explain it away, make an excuse, equivocate. Um, that I think is in many ways, even more traumatic or worrisome. Uh, I can take it, I got a thick skin. If somebody says from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. But when I say, you know what, this is how that is that impacts me and my community. Um, uh, and I'm not talking for myself, you know, I'm accountable to a, a board that has people on it who are, are also sit on boards at the New Israel Fund and at B'nai B'rith. And, and, and this, is, this is a broadly held view. Um, 
And the response is, okay, this time we'll accept that, but you have to understand that's not what was meant. And, and it, there's also, it's, it's a legitimate uh, uh, phrase um, that minimizes my estimation of how seriously the institution is taking anti-Semitism. And I'm picking on the TDSB just because it's top of mind, but this is something we're seeing everywhere. Uh, this is not confined to one institution. Uh, this is happening across the board. And I think um, this phrase is a good example where uh, our lived experience is not being centered. The impact on us is not being centered. Uh, in a way that is not in keeping with the standards that are applied to other people. And that double standard, the, the, that uh, is in some ways worse than, than the, uh, the, the incident itself. Thank you. Professor Nestel? Yeah, um, I think there's a different double standard going on here. And that is the standard that most liberal Jews, well-meaning people in this country believe that ethnic superiority of any kind is, is, is untenable, it's not desirable, it's something that should be from the last century, the century before that. Um, that's good for here, but they don't apply the same principles to Israel and Palestine. Um, to me, when I think of from the river to the sea, and I think uh, the Palestinian intellectual use of Munir, Munir wrote a very good piece in Jewish Currents a couple of months ago about what it means from the river to the sea. It means that everyone who lives in that area has equal rights, um, equal ability to self-determination. Um, I think Bernie, unfortunately, the two-state solutions ship has sailed with 750,000 Jewish settlers living in Palestinian land with the, um, you know, the, the separate roads, separate everything with the um, separate legal system that convicts 99% of Palestinians who are indicted for something um, with the arrest of Palestinian children. This is not, there's no equality there and there won't be any equality there without getting the Jewish foot off the Palestinian neck. Um, I think that we have to start applying the same principles that we would apply here to there that no one ethnic group has the right to oppress, dictate, steal the land of another group um, for whatever reason. I mean, you may think that the Jewish right to self-determination is a, is a more important right. It's a right that we, uh, that we deserve by, by dint of our suffering. Um, but I think that this is not a Jewish way to think about things. Um, I think that it's not hate to want equality to want freedom, to want to be able to live life, to want to not be bombed, to you know, want to have access to the same resources as, as your neighbors on the other side of the border. Um, this, and, and, and the, to think that Jews are threatened by this demand is very concerning to me. To think that we place Jews, that you're more worried about Jews being offended by somebody saying from the river to the sea, then you are by what Israel is doing to Palestinians, that really concerns me. I think that does not really represent a Jewish set of values or way of thinking. Thank you. Professor Weinfeld. Well, um, in my very quick final comment, um, I, I, I think I'm not certain that that ship has sailed. Uh, I think it's the only ship that will ever be able to sail. I don't see the constituencies, at least in Israel, for uh, that kind of equality that you discuss. I think the situation for Palestinians living as citizens of Israel in the 67 borders is very different from the situation of the Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza, but that's a subject for a long uh, debate and discussion. But uh, I just think that <clears throat> one of the things that you know, that, that can be tried to be done is, is, is see if there is a way to, to uh, strengthen or revive intellectually and create, creatively the idea of a two-state solution, which can include, by the way, all sorts of other interesting citizenship decisions that have to do with some of the Israeli settlements and some of the 
uh, Palestinian settlements within the current state of Israel. So if there is a way, I'm not prepared to abandon the two-state solution. Okay, that takes us a little beyond, of course, what we were talking about with anti-Semitism, and it takes us past 915. Um, so if it's okay with the speakers, I'd like to say thank you, um, unless someone feels like they have a a, a burning desire to absolutely res require a rejoinder. Good. Um, so let me say thank you very much. Um, I had started out the evening saying that I hoped to learn from the differences of opinion, but also from seeing where there's agreement. Um, and I, I think I, I want to thank all of you for proving that to be correct uh, in my eyes, that um, even though we really did come from such a variety of different perspectives and backgrounds and political views, uh, some of which were expressed just then here at the end, um, I, I, I was struck by, in many ways, how very frequently you were agreeing more than you disagreed. And I, I thought that was a very appropriate way to uh, mark Hanukkah uh, and the messages of Hanukkah with people coming together in Kuala Israel. I want to thank, of course, um, Professor Nestle, Professor Weinfeld, Mr. Shack, Mr. Farber. But I also want to thank um, our co-hosts who are handling um, all the technical details behind the scenes, Kathy Sikora and Marianne Levitsky, my fellow volunteers from Darkly Noam, um, the people who helped plan this evening on the Adult Education Committee of Darkly Noam, um, and David McKee, um, the lay president of Darkly Noam that supported um, this from the beginning and uh, encouraged us um, to cautiously proceed in hopes that this would be a successful event. Uh, and uh, I hope um, that we have um, met his expectations. So thank you to everyone. And thank you for everyone for being such a good audience. Um, Chag Chag Good night. Good night. Good night. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach.